video. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is a uh, Tiger Sports Report. Welcome to the Tiger's Lair. We got uh, Leroy Watson and uh, Farrakhan Hall. Appreciate you uh, joining us. How you feeling? Feeling good, man. Happy to be here. Thank y'all for having me on. Uh, no problem. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, jump back to your high school days. Uh, I mean, you were at White Station. Uh, you went to the state championship back-to-back, uh, -to -back, won it in 2009. What was it like being a top player uh, in basketball here in the city of Memphis? Uh, it was a good time. Uh, it was a bit of a transition for me. I had to sit out for most of my junior year because I transferred to White Station from MUS where I had won a state championship before. And um, I remember back then, Jason Smith used to do my do my report. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I transferred to White Station and then we went to the state championship my junior year and then my senior year we, went, we won it. And it was, it was a great time, man, playing like playing alongside with Joe Jackson and uh, Andre Hollins and other guys that were on that team. Man. It was a great time. I, I was great memories. Leroy, you have any questions for him about his uh, high school days? Yeah, uh, you know, I'd actually forgotten that Farrell had won that state championship with Matt Bakke over at uh, MUS. Jerry Peters was the head coach, but Matt actually took them to state because Coach Peters got sick at the last moment. So, Farrell, you're a little bit of history. You won the last state championship at White Station and the only state championship at MUS. What was it like back in those ring collecting days, man? Man, you know, it was almost, I kind of felt like it was just, that was the way that it was supposed to be for me at the time. That might be ungrateful, <laughs> but I have been so used to winning. I grew up playing in the uh, War Eagles program, uh, and we always would go to the national championship and maybe fall short, but we went to three national championships in a row. So I was used to playing in championship games. So that was it. I felt like that was my pedigree. I always was a winner. So it was good, but, you know, I expected it almost. And in the ensuing years, I've become really, really close with Coach Patino. Tell everybody what it was like playing for Jesus Patino at White Station. Coach Patino was great. Uh, <laughs> he, was, he had a big imagination. And, you know, he all wanted us all to do well. You know, we come in and work hard, and he just was all about his players. You know, he allowed us to be, be who our best our best selves. And, you know, we had Joe, you know, so it was like <laughs> he relied on that a lot. Joe was like a cheat code, wasn't he? Super cheat code, man. Joe was the best player I had ever seen to that point. And I saw every player in the country, but he was the best. And have you noticed on Facebook, I don't know why it is, but on Facebook, I've noticed several threads that have been talking about Joe in the last few days. Have you been noticing any of those? Yeah, I've noticed it. It was because uh, John Wall was on uh, Instagram Live and he was talking about actually our old team when we played them in the Bass Pro wow. tournament. Right. Yeah, he was talking about that team and he was just saying how Joe was so good. Joe gave him 40 and dumped yep. them. That was a big time game. And, uh, you know, everybody just, wanted to see him do so well. And I mean, for my money, Joe had a fantastic college career and people forget, you know, they listed Joe at 6'1". Joe was 5'11 at best. When you're that small, you, yeah. you know, you, your professional limitations are, are what they are. It's hard to make it in the NBA that size. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, what do they say? It's only like 400 jobs in the NBA. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to get in, but he definitely stepped his foot in there. He went to a few training camps and preseason. So, you know, everybody has dreams of making the NBA, but a lot of people don't understand that it's very tough. And he is really good. I think he lay, leads the state in scoring. You know, not just the city of Memphis, but the entire state in scoring. And it's by a landslide, like, over all the people who are up there with him in the top five in scoring are from the 50s and 60s. It's not even in the 2000s or 90s, you know what I mean? So Joe is, is great, man. He was the first person, like, I come to practice, and he'd be, like, teaching me how to break down players. As a sophomore in high school, and it was, like, he was, like, robotic, man. I'd never seen anybody like that. And it's funny, the leading scorer in the state of Tennessee history, Bingo Smith, who went to the NBA, played for Cleveland Cavaliers, actually played five years 
And that's what a lot of folks don't know. And I don't know how many points he scored that eighth grade year. But yeah. if you take his eighth grade year out, he and Joe are neck and neck. See what I'm saying? That's that's what I mean, man. Joe is amazing. He's amazing. I think he averaged 38 for one month. <laughs> and, and high school, and, that's eight minute quarters. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, and, you know, people like to go back and change history. I saw somebody say, I just thought he was a good player. No, <laughs> this kid was great. He was super special. He was no. way, way, way more than just good. No, he was amazing. He was amazing. One time we were playing, and the ball, like, rolled on the ground under the goal, like baseline, under the, under the goal at the Palace. And, like, everybody was down there trying to grab it. He came up with the ball and went straight up and dumped it off two feet. At five, eleven, whatever you want to call it, that was amazing. <laughs> I'm like, damn, I can't believe he just ducked it. But he was that that type of athlete. Like, he couldn't be hurt. He just was amazing, man. I had never seen anybody like him. From dribbling, yeah. shooting, um, understanding the game, he was awesome. Only guy I can really compare him to is Allen Iverson, because yeah. the play you just described at the Palace. I saw Allen Iverson the exact same thing on national TV at Georgetown. It was like, how did he get that ball? And oh my God, what did he two hand dunk just off two feet? And it's like, what? Yeah. And I saw a lot of Allen Iverson in Joe Jackson. Yeah, that's what that, that's what I think he saw that in himself too. He wanted to be a lot like Isaiah Thomas and uh and Allen Iverson. He started to change his mind. Um uh, as to the type of player he wanted to be around his senior year. I mean, I can't speak for him, but I remember him talking to me about it. But he would always – he was trying to learn how to be more of a point guard. So he started studying like Isaiah Thomas. But early on when I first met him, he was really into Michael Jordan. Like he would sit up and watch Michael Jordan tapes. <laughs> Constantly. I like Joe. Just like a student of the game, man, for real. So, yeah, he was awesome, but – it was good to be his teammate and, and get to learn and, and see somebody's work ethic like that. Okay, so Brian, we've done hijacked everything. We've been talking about Joe oh, five minutes. minutes. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> now, uh, go back to you, you know your recruiting. Uh, how did uh, what schools were recruiting you? Uh, obviously, I mean you're from Memphis. So, you know, what was the decision going to Seton Hall compared to Memphis? Well, initially, I committed to Georgia Tech um, my sophomore year at MUS. And then once I transferred from MUS, I had to sit out for a year. So not only did I sit out, that also that, that summer going into my junior year, I almost broke my ankle. So I had to sit out all of the main showcase tournaments, uh, Peach Jam and all these things. So a lot of schools dropped off of me by the time that I was a junior and I was coming back onto the court. So I had offers from Missouri, um, Arkansas, um, UAB, and Seton Hall. And Memphis kind of withered away as I became a senior. Uh, things about my game changed when I went over to White Station playing with Joe. And I wasn't allowed to have the ball as much, you know, just play with somebody who scores 30, 40 points a game. That's just how it was. So I kind of more took on the role so to make sure that we could win. And uh, once uh, – once that kind of happened, I probably didn't stand out as much. So, I, like I said, at the end of it all, by the end of my senior year, I had UAB and I had Seton Hall. And the coach from Seton Hall was great. We took our visit there. And I always knew that I didn't want to go to UAB because back then UAB was like a <laughs> rock. Yeah. So I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going there. And I went on to Seton Hall. And uh, I went and visited. And you know, my mom thought it was a great choice, and it was. It was a good, good opportunity to get away from the city and go up there and, you know what I mean, learn and be in a bigger bigger city, bigger environment, learn, meet new people, and it was great. And then uh, that led me on back to Memphis. Now, I'm originally from New Jersey, so what, what was Jersey like? I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of things people hate about Jersey. What, what, what was your impressions of Jersey that you, when you were there? I remember my first impression when I got off the plane you know, coming from Memphis, I had never been anywhere else. And, like, I was actually going there for college. So I got off the plane, got in the car with my coach, and we were in traffic. Like, he was <laughs> driving crazy. And it was so many crazy cars going around. I was just like, man, I'm, I was nervous for, for at least, like, 
two days I was really nervous, but I got over it and, you know, it, it ended up being a great experience. Like I started learning how to live faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah drive faster. <laughs> drive faster, yeah. So. Leroy, any, any, any questions about his time uh, recruiting or Seton Hall? Yeah. Um, Farrell, when I think about Seton Hall, of course, they were in the old Big East, the real Big East. Big East is out there now, and the real Big East is watered down. Um, and I think about physicality. How much more physical was the play in the Big East then than it was even when you came back to Conference USA? It was so much different. When I came back to Conference USA, even the guys on our team at the time, it was just a – like <laughs> – and there, when I played at Seton Hall, I wouldn't even consider to be one of our most physical players at all. Like, the referees wouldn't call fouls or anything. Like, what I was doing was normal. But coming back and playing in Conference USA, even in practice, guys was like, dang, like, you being too tough. That was, that was what I was used to, especially being undersized. Up there, I was playing the five, and I'm playing against UConn, who had – they played two – Seven foot uh, forward and a seven foot center. You got Pittsburgh. You got uh, everybody. Georgetown. Georgetown. Every team had real bigs, and I had to battle with those guys. So that's what I was used to. But it, the physicality was a real thing. Like some teams in our conference practice with helmets and pads on. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and I know coming out of Memphis. That's what you were known for. If White Station needed a critical rebound, Farrell was supposed to get it. If they needed a block shot, you needed somebody to get tough, physical, that's what you would do. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you go to Seton Hall, you go to the Big East, you take physicality to a whole other level. I mean, it was arguable that the Big East was more physical than the NBA back then. Yeah, it was. It was super physical, man. You got you had guys like Hashim to beat. That's when Kimball Walker was there uh, at UConn. Uh, Syracuse, that was the great Syracuse team. The 2-3 the zone, they had all guys 6-9. I mean, 1-5, through five, West Virginia. It was it's unmatched. I've never seen college basketball that way. Again. Did you enjoy it? I loved it. I loved it, you know. I loved it, but I didn't love the opportunity to play at home more. And that's not even to be cheesy, you know what I mean? I really wanted to come home and hoop for Memphis, so it just came down to, all right, I think I got a better chance of – I wanted to be an NBA player. Want, still want to be. But uh, at the time, I felt like my the better opportunity for me to become that would be in Memphis because of the style of play that was happening. And, you know, I had a great relationship with Joe. Joe told me that he wanted me to come back and play with him uh, at Memphis. And I was down for it. When did you first reach out to Coach Pastor and say, hey, look, I really would like to come home? First, first, or when I was at Seton Hall first? <laughs> uh, when you were at Seton Hall first. Yeah. So at Seton Hall, uh, I'll say after I got my papers to uh, to uh, be, what, what is it called, released from, from Seton Hall. Like, that was the first call that I made. Um, and a part of my thinking was the reason why I went and asked to be released was I saw that a uh, guy, Angel Garcia, had been – released from their team. And he played the same position as me. Mobile yep. four man. Um he was a good player. But he had moved on and went on home to go go make money and play ball. So I said, all right, basically that's my spot. It opened up. And I'm in the middle of the season with my team at Seton Hall, but I really knew where I wanted to be. And that's why I made the decision. So I ended up having to sit out a full year from that date, December eighth. And uh, I got to play again. The next time I played again was uh, against Louisville. Uh, the following year on December 8th. And Coach Pastner had an interesting relationship with transfers. His his theory on it was very simple. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, did he have a frank discussion with you about it up front or at some point? But his thinking was, well, if you're going to transfer and you're going to be on scholarship, he'll take you. But if you want to play, you've got to clearly be better than anyone else at your position. Was that something that he made clear to you before you transferred in? Um, he made it clear that nothing would be given, that I would have to earn my earn my play. But he definitely 
told me what I needed to do to be able to become one of his guys, one of his starters or in the eight man rotation. And I went about it. I did it. And when I came in, I started automatically, you know, started for my junior season uh, and the beginning of my senior season. Because uh, I'll never forget. Well, I say I'll never forget, even though I don't remember all the details, but uh, I came into the back end of a conversation you were having with someone after you graduated, and it became apparent to me as I was, you know, started ear ear humping a little bit that they were bad mouthing your time in Memphis and telling you you should have never come. Coach Fastner did you wrong. You got them straight. Like, oh no, 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 no! You got this all wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, hey, maybe I didn't start my whole time at Memphis, but that wasn't promised to me, and I would never trade my time coming home for anything I've ever done. Is that still the way you feel? Yeah, I mean, looking back on it, um, I'm definitely proud to have been a Tiger and played at the University of Memphis. Um, I wish that things could have gone differently. I feel like I could have contributed more to the team um, as a player on the court, but like I said back then. Uh, I had my opportunity, we had our time, and you go forward from there, you know. Um, we all learned, and Coach Passner has learned. We had conversations after that. He's doing, I'm, I'm not sure, is he still at Georgia Tech now? Still at Georgia Tech. Yeah, so he's he is there. I'm doing my thing. My career has been good, so <laughs> that's just it. Now, with, in your Memphis career, what is one game you wish you could uh, take back and redo, change the outcome? One game I wish we could change the outcome. Uh, I know. This is an easy one. The St. Louis game um, in 2000, I think that was, was that 2012? Oh, and the NCAA yeah. tournament. NCAA tournament. Play against St. Louis. We were playing really well. It was back and forth game, and man, I just wish we could have stayed together better. You know, there was a breakdown at the end, and I mean, nobody on the outside would know, but one person said something to one person, and it was that was it. Yes, yes. Please, we need to talk about that. I'm glad you bring that game up, Errol, because it's been said that everything turned over one argument. And so the rumors have flown about who it was, and it's never been revealed. My understanding, Will Barton was involved. And so the other participant, I don't know. Enlighten me. Man, I wish I could, but, you know, some things have to stay in the huddle. (laughs) Uh, Okay. All right. Fair. That's fair. Just verify for me, was Will involved? Was Will one of the primaries involved? I don't know. I know Will got up there after the game, and – like he he poured his heart out after the game, uh, before he declared to go to the uh, to the NBA. I'm not sure, you know, that ain't really my place to say. But he uh, he definitely gave his all that entire season. That's another guy who was super committed. Say it again. No question. No yeah. question. He gave his all. Yeah, because, I mean, back to that St. Louis game, it was the weirdest thing ever. You you guys really – the scoreboard didn't indicate it, but y'all were on cruise control. You were going to win that basketball. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, they don't know how to play, they don't know how to execute, they don't know how to defend. What in the world is going on here? It's one of the weirdest games I've ever seen in my life. I remember it like yesterday. It seemed like we were, we were about to dominate them. And then the guys start, they start hitting bank threes. Yeah. I, I just start having them like, all right, this is this not going right. But, you know, that's the NCAA tournament. That's the tournament for you. And, of course, uh, a lot of the narrative after that game was Rick Majerus outcoached Josh Passman. Um, I don't know that I agree with that on the face of it. Uh, Because clearly, you know, like you're saying, there was something going on with the guys. I thought Coach Pastner did a good job. Majerus did his job. Um, But I think the enduring narrative until all of us are gone from this earth will be Rick Majerus out coach Josh Pastner. And I think it's a shame that that's how it's all going to end up being 
you know, buttoned up and presented well, to everybody. I think that was going to be the, the narrative even before that game. Whether it came down to us winning or not, they were going to say that Rick Majerus coached better because he's more a, a tenured coach. He he had more experience. He's a great coach. You know, wherever his principles are, defensive principle, whatever it is, he's he's world not renowned for being a great coach. So Coach Pass was just learning. I love him, but he was just learning how to to you know say handle that. And I'm not gonna put it on that. We should have won. We had better players. So that's all it comes down to. End of the day, we were out there. And when you look at your draw, if you get past that St. Louis game, you had a pretty decent shot at making a Final Four at least that year. Yeah, we had we would have matched up with a we would have matched up with Michigan State with Draymond Green. Right. And in that St. Louis game, as we were leading, I'm in my mind. Like I'm about, to, I'm about to kill Draymond. <laughs> my mom was looking to play against him, but it played out the way that it did. I was, it, everything just went downhill. It was like, okay, but and even at that, you guys still had an opportunity to sneak it out at the end. It's amazing how the wheels fell off, but you guys still pressed. You fought through it, and you, you, you had an opportunity there at the end. And as the old saying goes, that's all you really want is a chance to win at the end. Yeah. I'd like to ask you a question. Of the teams yeah. that you've seen, what were our team ranked talent-wise for you? Oh, that team, team that lost to St. Louis? Yeah. You would have to compare that team from a talent perspective to the Calipari National Championship game team. Mm. Because when you really think about it, Against Kansas, he really got down to six guys. That's really what he had. Mm -hmm. He had a starting five, and he had Sean Taggart. And Sean was young and really wasn't ready for the moment, and that's why they lost when mm -hmm. Joey Dorsey fouled out. I would argue that your team was every bit as talented as that team. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you didn't have a Derrick Rose, you know, or Joey Dorsey, but every bit as talented as that team. You can't forget about Tariq Black now. That's true. Tariq point. That year, he shot like 69% from the field. Yeah. For the full season. That's amazing. He never missed. <laughs> he would be one tough, tough matchup for Calipari's championship game team. I appreciate that. That's, that's, a, that's a big statement. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. And I would compare your team and talent to the Penny Hardaway, David Vaughn team as well. Wow. And once again, that's a team that didn't go further because David Vaughn got hurt uh, and Penny just didn't have enough in him all by himself to carry that team any further. And they still made the Elite Eight. Mm -hmm. um, I think your team was comparable in talent to both of those teams. Um, just had that one bad matchup. Uh, otherwise, no question you were a Sweet 16 team. I absolutely believe you were going to beat Michigan State because I was doing the same things in my head, Farrell, that you did in yours. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like to mention with Michigan State. Okay, moving on. And then you would have been Sweet 16. Um, but unfortunately, it's not just talent <laughs> to win a basketball game. Yeah. You got to be able to execute. And we, we did not execute down the, down the stretch of that. And then the same thing. When we got our chance at Michigan, chance to, chance to play Michigan State in Detroit in the NCAA the following year, I wasn't as much a part of that game, but yes, that whole season was rocky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of guys had moved on between transfer and, of course, Will declaring for the draft. Uh, the talent level had dropped tremendously. The team from the year before would destroy that team the following year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's kind of when Memphis basketball started going back into the wilderness and losing some of the edge that it had before. And uh, what did you think when Penny started bringing some of that back and some of the buzz around Memphis basketball again? Man, I was excited. Super excited for him to be, first of all, for him to become the coach. I had talked to him a few years before. Uh, back when Coach Tubby was the coach, just asking what he uh, 
why wouldn't he become the coach? You know what I mean? I, I, I felt like it was his time, and he just said that he wanted to give it a little bit more time, let things settle down, and then he would come in and, and, and set it right, and he did. You know, uh, I think he's done a great job with the program, bringing that hype back to the city and making everybody be involved. So now it's just people got to stick with him. Yeah, so, hey, Brian. Yes. Um, a, a little bit of Pharaoh history, a very recent history that uh, I want to catch up with him and you on. Uh, last time I watched Farrakhan Hall play was almost a year ago to the day now. It was uh, last June, no, last May. And uh, it was a pro-am. You know, the Bluff City Classic is gone. So uh, it was called the Eighth League out in Raleigh. Uh, Penny's team won it. Uh, Penny's team was loaded up, but we're not even going to get into all of that. <laughs> uh, I, I had a long talk with Farrakhan after I got a chance to watch him. And in my opinion, he was clearly the best player at the Pro-Am. Apologies to Penny Hardaway, because, you know, Penny's not what he once was. And, you know, everyone <laughs> Um, it was just so impressive to see Pharaoh's growth. You know, he lo moves laterally so much better than he used to. The jumper is really good. He's setting players up. He doesn't rush. And so when he made the G League this year, I wasn't surprised whatsoever. I was not surprised. And I hated that the coronavirus, you know, scuttled everything the way it did because his career path was really, really turning. And, hey, it's still not too late, man. That NBA dream ain't dead quite yet, my friend. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, you also played over in uh, – uh, was it Japan? Yeah, I played in Japan. I played a full season in Japan. And that was a big part of my growth as a player. Just my overall after, – after college, man, really sitting down and deciding that I really want to be a professional basketball player. And I, I did whatever I could sacrificed a lot of a lot of time and a lot of fun and a lot of things just to become the best player that I possibly could be so what you saw Leroy and I thank you for the compliment man it's just a product of hard work you know your your time in, in Japan what was the I guess the atmosphere like in, in I guess an Asian country compared to here in the United States? Did they take their basketball as serious? You know, what, what was that whole experience like, you know, with the fans and the basketball? Yeah, it's very serious. They take it very seriously. Any, I mean, Japanese, the Japanese culture is to do anything that you do to the best of your ability. Like, from your living circumstances to anything, you have to be really um, particular. So I learned quite a bit about discipline, being there and uh, we worked out twice a day uh, practice we would practice at nighttime from about 6 p.m until like 10 30 at night and oh, four and a half hours yeah every day wow every, every day so <laughs> and we would play two games a week one on friday well one on saturday and one on sunday the one on saturday would be at seven at night and then the one sunday would be 2 30 you play the same team back to back hmm. you know so we played 50 games there. I was there for about 10 months, uh, a little over 10 months, actually. And, man, it just taught me a great lesson. Like, my living conditions weren't that great. I really was just locked in on becoming a better ball player. So, Farrell, for any young aspiring hooper out there who's trying to make it to the next level, whether it's middle school to high school, high school to college, college to pro, Talk a little bit about your routine and what you have done as you've continued to get better as a basketball player. Well, first of all, like, at the end of my time at Memphis, I basically, my senior year, I graduated averaging 0, 0.0 points and zero rebounds, you know, for my senior year. So I went on from there just, like, knowing that I was better than it, you know, and – not only knowing I was better than that, but understanding the work that I had to put in. So I did adopt a routine. So every morning I would wake up early in the morning, 5.30, 6 a.m. I would go to the gym, lift weights. Um, from there I would go if I had to, had to work a job or whatever the situation was. At one point I was working at the Michael Bar. I would go to work. Once I got off of work, I would go back to the gym 
and get the work in on the skill work. It's important to always get skill work in. And then at nighttime, I would go and I would play. Like I was around, if I was around the city in the summertime, I would always make sure I go play with Penny or any pickup, you know what I mean? Always scheduling it. So weights, um, it's always lifting weights, some type of stretching or something like that. And then going to get the skill work in by myself or with, with my friend or with the trainer like that. And then also playing, you know what I'm saying? And doing that for a long time, you can't help but get better. And you got to put the right things in your body. You got to take care of your, your body. You got to fuel the engine. So people have to really take that seriously. But it's a big commitment, man. And the people around you have to be committed to it, too. You know, you can't. Girlfriends, if she don't understand it. For me, it was bye. <laughs> you know, um, but anybody. So I, I have a small circle, man, of people who understood what I was going after. And that was what I did. I, I've been playing in the G League. I played in the G League for four years now. Uh, this past season was a returning year to a team that I went to the playoffs with before. And uh, previous to that, I played in Japan. Like you said, I also played in Saudi Arabia where I, where I won an Arab Cup championship. Uh, um, where does I play? I played in uh, Czech Republic. Uh, I started off in uh, Copenhagen in Denmark. So I've been, I, I've been able to wheel my way around a few places. And now I, I plan on taking it up or even a, 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 another notch. Uh, unfortunately, the season last year ended. Uh, because of coronavirus, but I felt like I was right there, you know, and getting a chance to make it to the NBA. But either way, man, I just want to play at the highest level uh, and compete at the highest level against the best players. You know me. What's your thoughts on, uh, you know, the G League going after some of these stars like Jalen Green and stuff like that? You know, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, the G League's progression and, and the where, where they're going? Well, obviously, like I said, I played there four years, so, I agree with the G League. I understand. And I, I think that they are. It's a league that can be overlooked, but there's a lot of great talent. And the coaches are very talented. Uh, they have an understanding for who we as players want to be. You know what I mean? Guys grow up from age eight, nine, wanting to be a professional basketball player. So the fact that they're getting the opportunity at 18 as soon as they possibly can, I think it's fair. The G League is doing a great thing. And then they will teach them the way to be a professional, a professional and, and, and like understand their craft. They'll teach them how to handle their money. They have finance classes, uh, how to handle relationships with people, all types of things, community service. You have everything that you need to learn in order to go forth and be uh, prosperous. So I think it's great. And, and Farrell, when you look at it, um, Major League Baseball can draft you straight out of high school. Um, the NFL is a different beast physically. So, you know, we won't even get into that. But uh, National Hockey League can draft you straight out of high school. Uh, do you think it's time for the NBA to once again be able to draft someone straight out of high school? Um, I will say that regardless, a guy 18, it's, it's very, it's, it's rare that you'll get a guy who's ready to come from high school to the NBA and play. And and not even just physically, it's, the game is more mental than anything. You know, a guy like Kobe Bryant is rare, you know, and yep. then yeah. you know, to even him, when he came in, he really wasn't ready. He got out there, he shot up a couple of air balls, whatever it was, but they could see his talent from the jump. So, um, yeah, they could, they could draft them. They should be able to draft those guys. They should have an opportunity to go out and make as much money as they possibly can. But I think the G League is a great step into that next, that next level. So from 18 to 19, they can go and they can learn the game. They can be lifted and be fully committed to becoming an NBA player, you know, and from there. But that's a life choice you have to make. Because at 18, if you make that decision, you might not get it. You're not, you're not going to be able to get a scholarship to go back to college. Now, I agree with that, too. I, I do agree with that. And, you know, I, I think that would only be fair to attach that to it. You know, you've made this choice, so now you've got to play it out. I would love to see it where, let's say, the Grizzlies draft somebody 
uh, let's just say you're an 18 year old Farrakhan Hall, they draft you and then they assign you to the hustle. Mm. And then you stay with the hustle until they feel like you're ready, which would be akin to Major League Baseball and the minor league system. I don't know why the G League can't be a part of an NBA minor league system. And maybe they're working toward that. I, I like the move they're making. I just don't like it long term. I, I hope they have something different that they've got envisioned. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like that. It is the minor league system to an extent. We our teams are there for their guys to come down and and play whenever they need. You know, what I mean, they need reps or they're not getting enough playing time, or even if they need to come and practice. Um, like that happens often. Or if somebody if somebody is out from their team, that's how you guys get called up. You go up there, you might be a fill in for practice, or you can get some playing time in the game. But as far as them, say, like you said, wanting to draft a guy and then sending them to the G League, the conditions aren't up to par for what a guy like that would need. You know what I mean? Previously, like they would have guys, like they just changed the rule where they, it used to be two guys to one room. Um, in hotels and, and stuff like that. So me, myself, being an older guy, I would get my own room. But <laughs> most guys be two guys. Yeah. Most guys would be two guys to a room. So like those guys that you just got drafted, you're not gonna you're not gonna want to go for it. You know what I mean? But now that they have more guys coming into the league that they'll be grabbing straight out of high school and stuff like that. And they're offering them three, four hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, you can afford to Go back to school. You can afford to get your own room, <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> so, what do you see as the biggest change in basketball in general from your high school days, which really is not that long ago? You know, it's not even ten years ago. Mm -hmm. But the biggest changes in basketball from then to now? Definitely the physicality. You can't when, when they change the hand checking rules. Or you can't put your hand on a guy. That changed the entire game. It's more. Yeah. It's definitely a, a, a offensive-minded game. It's for the crowd wants to see people score. The crowd wants to see dunks, and they want to see highlights. So they make every single rule in the offense's favor. If I jump with someone and we go up to the rim, and he he's jumping, he's trying to dunk on me. I have to be up in the air, straight up. And if he hits my body and I bend like this at all, it's a foul. They're going to call you. Yep. They're going to call a foul, going to the free throw line. It's going to be more points on the board. That's why you see all these crazy point totals, especially like in the G League, you'll see 150, 160 yeah. to 150, just because of like the rules are so strict and it's towards it. And then also uh, the three-point line man, has changed the game. Uh, and they actually started going by those percentages. Like I said uh, to someone else the other day, like driving to the basket, I could be open for a wide open layup. And if it's Somebody right there that shoots 40% from the three-point line, they want me to kick it out. Yep. You know what I mean? We would much rather an open three than a contested two. I, I, I really have a philosophical dif disagreement with that. And I understand that the number crunchers who are in power are dictating that. And, yeah, I get the math on it but it still, to me, will never be smart basketball. Passing up an almost NT2 for a three that is 20, 30, maybe even 40% less likely to happen. I, I'll never agree with it. Okay, so you got to clear it up. It's not necessarily the open two. If you got a wide open layup, okay, take the layup. But say you a guy like a Joe Jackson, 5'11", you feel like you can – get in there and maybe dunk on someone. You know what I mean? So you got somebody that's going to contest you at the rim. Maybe you are more athletic than him, but just the the whatever, laws of physics, I don't know how to say it. If you get somebody, you suck the defense in, and you got a guy open on the three-point line, you better kick it out or you might get taken out the game. Now that I agree with. I agree. But let's just say that's Farrakhan Hall going downhill, turning the corner for that too. I would never tell him, to kick it to Steph Curry. Go on, take that, Pharaoh, or get your free throws. I appreciate I'll that. Always that way. <laughs> you know what? I like my chances, too, at the rim. Absolutely. <laughs> but we're seeing more and more guys, 6'7", 6'8", 6'9", downhill, 
and they're still kicking for the three. I just, I will, I'll go to my grave never agreeing with that. I don't care what the numbers say. You don't I don't want to hear what, what the numbers say. Per 100 possessions, you don't care. No, I don't. <laughs> because the per 100 isn't going to win me this game right now in this situation. You know, whatever this situation is, like there may be five seconds left in this game and we're down by one. I don't care if we win this game by one point or by two points. So let me go ahead and get that layup or get my guy to the free throw line for two opportunities, and I'll live or die with that. But yeah. I don't want to live or die with the three. I got you. I'm the same way. They try to make us not shoot mid ranges, but that's my most deadliest weapon. So I stick to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, okay, if they want to say, all right, well, hey, the layup in there. Okay, fine. I got somebody seven, six, eight. Okay, pull up. Yeah. Not too many people are going to block you shot. And again, if they do try, they're probably going to foul you. And okay, once again, I'll take my two free throws. I can live with whatever happens. But I, oh, but you, having somebody your size, your skill set, downhill to a three point shooter, no, I'll never agree with that philosophy. Even, even as successful as it is, I, 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 you know, I know I'm probably dating myself right now. But I just never agree with that philosophy. I just won't. It all changed. I mean, we all know, man. It all changed with the Warriors and the way that they played. Yeah, yeah. that's the model. You know, uh, the the Rockets believe in it heavily as well. You saw Carmelo Anthony get himself cut because of. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so that's. I mean, that's how serious they are about it. Mm -hmm. Carmelo Anthony, one of the best forwards, I would say. Of, you know what I mean? Ever. Of his time ever cut <laughs> from a team because of the fact that his game is is more uh he, he wants to shoot mid range shots and they don't want it at all. A lot of teams are that way. Going back to, to so Brian, uh, go ahead, Brian, Brian. You're you're more of a football guy, but uh yeah. what are your thoughts uh, of your time watching basketball? Do you prefer the era now, the way it's played, or do you prefer some of the old school? Things? No, I I was going to ask him about the the Jordan documentary because me, I'm I'm old school. I, I like the physicality. I, I want to see you know Bill Lambeer and uh, against someone just throwing throwing elbows, throwing fists. <laughs> I mean, hockey is my first sport. So you know, when when I when I was growing up and just watching uh, you know '80s basketball, I'm like, oh, this is hockey on a court. I mean, I love this. So yeah, I'm. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm in that era, so that that's what I enjoy. I know a I'm lot a of Lakers guy myself. Nice. I think that was the golden age of the NBA, back in the early to mid '80s. Showtime Lakers and the Celtics, and then the Pistons came up and ended all of that. <laughs> at the end of the 80s. You don't like the physicality, Leroy. I mean, I do like the physicality though, because you gotta remember, even the Showtime Lakers were way more physical than, let's say, the Warriors. Yeah, but then again, they had to be because of the rules that were in place. You know, the, the people like to compare eras and pigeonhole guys in the way they played. The guys are taking advantage of the rules and doing what they're told they've got to do at any given time. Exactly, and you know, I, I will say, and I don't think y'all can disagree. Guys today are much more athletic than they were back then. Woo! It's no comparison. No, no comparison. comparison. So I think that the rules of the game have made guys become better athletes. Back then, those guys got away with those things, and it kind of slowed the game. Now, you see, I, I think I watched the old Bulls game, uh, Brian, and it was the, the, the final score was like 86 to 75. <laughs> yep. Sure. That was crazy. Yes. You know, there was a period of time when in the NBA Finals, you did not expect either team to score 100 points. And if they did, the – the commentators were going crazy, talking about, oh, wow, it was a really high-scoring contest. <laughs> and they scored 101 points. Yeah, but the, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, the rules have made guys have to be real athletes. You know, you can – Yes. A Kyle Anderson, man, you might not want to have him out there when it's crunch time. I like the guy, but, you know, he had to switch and be able to contest at the rim. They yeah. call him slow-mo for a reason, Pharaoh. Slow-mo. <laughs> <laughs> So have you watched the Jordan documentary? And yeah. What are, yes. What are your thoughts on it? 
I watch it faithfully, man. I, I love it. Uh, I especially like the uh, the episode about Dennis Rodman. <laughs> okay. I, I, I like his personality. Uh, I mean, and it gave me a better understanding for who he was and how Phil Jackson was as a coach and what made him so great. Uh, and I kind of try to apply some of those things to myself, just being one of those guys that's like, F it, man. I'm going to go out here and do, you know what I mean, do my job and I can be whoever I am off the court. <laughs> you know, I think that was, I think that was that was a big part of them being winners. And man, you see him laying out on the baseline for loose balls. Like he did that later at night too. He went out and went hard. Whenever he whatever he did, he was a hundred percent himself. So I appreciated it. I like the you know when Rodman was breaking down the, the you know, like the, the way you know if it hits here, you know he knows he just knows where to go. He could break down a rebound. I mean, it just I found new respect for him just because he knew his craft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Is he? I mean, but you got to think about it. He had a guy like Jordan and Scotty. Then he got Steve Kerr. He had one job, running get the rebound. So, man, he probably was doing that for a while, especially when he got there with the Pistons. When you get with an NBA team or any NBA organization, they'll tell you what they want you to do, and it'll be up to you to just really get that down, you know. Uh, so. Understanding how the ball comes off is it's cool. And he definitely mastered it. I saw one of the craziest stats ever. They show Dennis Rodman's career high rebound total against every NBA team. His lowest career high was 17 rebounds, I think. That's his lowest. And he had he had a career high of 32 against somebody. Probably this guy mind. was six, six, eight, two and a quarter. And he, it, it was just nuts. Mm-hmm. And we're not talking about he had 32 rebounds against the worst team in the league. He had 32 rebounds against somebody like the Rockets or somebody. It, it was crazy to see that chart. Yeah, but that shows you like, it's almost like the evolution of humans. Like, I might be going too far, but guy like him, he was super athletic compared to those guys when he came into the league with the Pistons. Yep. He was super athletic. And then he goes and matches up with Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan. And now his role is to be the guy who goes and grabs the rebounds. I saw a song where Mike, like, got out of his way so that he can grab the rebound. You know, that's almost like Russell Westbrook padding stats. They gave him those rebounds, but they were so much more athletic than the guys they were playing against. Bill Lambert right. couldn't jump with those guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think you put a guy like Serge Ibaka in that time, he'll dominate. Ooh. Yes, yes. I mean, Serge I would, would have been a monster in the 80s. Yeah, he would have been a monster. So. For Memphis, who would be your, uh, I guess, Mount Rushmore of Memphis basketball players? Oh, 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 oh. Nice. I stay away. Putting from you it. on the spot, man. <laughs> I stay away from it, man. I see it all the time. I see y'all's Facebook groups, and I just, <laughs> I just look at them. Um, I can't honestly. I can't say that I know enough about Memphis basketball history, uh, to say who my Mount Mount Rushmore would be. I grew up watching Hamilton High School. That was the neighborhood I grew up in, right in uh, South Memphis. So those were always my legends I, I can't say even with Penny Hardaway I watched him when I was in, in when I got to high school I watched his old film so I couldn't I couldn't put a name on it man the best player high school player I saw though Joe Jackson hands down okay. that's fair mm-hmm. that's fair hands down um, and, and again I mentioned it earlier I just don't like it. If you don't like the guy or you didn't like his game or whatever, okay, that's fine. But don't go back and try to change history and talk about him like he was just average or something. He was so, so far above average that it's an insult to indicate anything different. Yeah. You know, it was, it someone does. wants to put Joe on Mount Rushmore, I ain't got a problem with that. You know, is that no a problem part- whatsoever? It's, and I know y'all have a lot of viewers here. Uh, as I've gone other places and been able to play, even in the summertime and just training, I would really hope that guys here 
can get an understanding for how to play the game. You know, it's not about being a superstar player mm-hmm. and about coming down, being able to beat your man one on one. I mean, you want to be skilled and be able to do those things, but really being able to play team ball at a high level is the most important thing that any of us can do. We only have maybe one or maybe two NBA players, and we should have so many more. But I feel like it's because we aren't being taught the right way to play. You know, some guys think that they are, but they aren't. You know, and and you got all these people who have all these conversations, and it's fun and entertaining, but the people who really know basketball probably have to do a little bit more as far as giving back and helping understand. You know, I have experience in the G League, and when I when I first went to like when I first went to Seton Hall, man, I didn't know anything. Like I thought I did. I, I learned a lot from Coach Baki at MUS, but then when I left there and and I, and I got a part of the city school um, uh, competition, it's like there's no, it's not really a lot of logic in the way that the, the games are played. And I think that that needs to be implemented so that guys can be more successful. If guys want to become actual pros and NBA players and, and have a great overseas careers. You got to understand what it really takes. And it's not just going out there, rolling the ball out and doing your thing. So in the future, when your playing days are done, hopefully, in the, you know, you'll have a longer career. Let's say 10, 15 years from now, will there be a coach hall? No. <laughs> really? No, never. I can't do it. I think you're coaching material. I really do. Not the first you, time I heard that. <laughs> the way you relate to people, uh, your basketball IQ, and then uh, the way you're able to get your point across, like what you just said just a few moments ago. I mean, that was the kind of thing a coach would conceive of saying. So I would like to ask you not to close the door on that possibility. <laughs> for the right opportunity, maybe, but for right now. Oh, yeah, no, not right now, later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love basketball, man. I love the game. And a lot of times I say no because I just know that it'll drive me crazy. Like, like the details of the game and I feel like right. coaches have a great responsibility like some of my 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 my, my favorite coach uh, uh Jerry Peters who is a great coach yes he he would bring me in his office all the time sit me down and talk to me just about life things and I grew so much from that having understanding just like what what you do in real life translate to the court and you know I so said I also had other coaches uh Frank Harris who committed countless hours uh, to me. Like uh, Tyler Harris is dead. Yep. He committed so many hours to me uh, becoming a, a better player. You know what I mean? And I just feel like, it's, man, it's a great responsibility. It's almost like adopting kid year after year after year. So right now, <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. I can understand. Now, with the, uh, too. Huh? the the kids have changed. Yeah. Uh, they're definitely more difficult to coach now. I, I, I know that as an absolute <laughs> fact. So I, I know you've got to keep that in the back of your mind too, Farrell. Because everybody's getting better separately. Like as 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 an individual, people are getting better. So egos go up. Yes, I can only imagine. Now with this uh, coronavirus lockdown, what are, what have you been doing to stay in shape and get ready for this upcoming season for you? Um, I had like a I guess you could say a yoga thing going on for uh, this past month. Every day I committed to about 20 minutes of stretching and I'll post it on my, uh, on my Instagram story. Uh, also, I just get a run in outside. I get on my bike and go biking, uh, doing some lifting um, with just like a makeshift weight set that I have, you know, just trying to stay active as much as possible. I love working out outdoors though. Like that was kind of my thing. Uh, in my transition to be getting better um, as a professional, I take off running outside. Like I just go outside and just run. I I used to run all the way down um, Elvis Presley, all the way up to Hamilton High School and Graceland, um, just to go and work out. Man, that's a long run, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's a long run. 
But you might see me biking, man. You might see me biking down uh, 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 Poplar one day. I don't know. Now, I saw you doing some drills. You were running up a hill. Mm -hmm. What were you doing? I was, uh, I was probably on Bill Street Landing. Yes, yes. Talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, so I go down to Bill Street Landing, and man, when you get out there, you just look around, it's like, like for me, it's like a playground. It's like all this different stuff you can do to work out. You got different hills, steep hills. You got 100-yard 100, uh, 100 hills. So go out there, and I just start creating stuff to do. <laughs> so I would get my sprints in on that uh, Bill Street Landing hill, going up and down, uh, up to the top, and maybe jog down. They have the monkey bars out there where you can, you know what I mean, climb the bars and do pull-ups. They also got plenty of cases of stairs. They got sand down there. Uh, they got everything you need. Everything we need is right outside. All you need is your body weight. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's what I do. I only got a couple questions left. Uh, since being inside, uh, any Netflix shows, anything you've been addicted to or binge watched? The one thing that I was addicted to was Ozark. I was addicted to Ozark. It, I finished that about a month ago, though. So, no, I haven't been addicted to any TV shows. I actually started this new course, and I got to finish it up. I kind of been lacking uh, this past week. <laughs> but um, I, I started a course. Uh, it's a streetwear design. Um, it's the Parsons School of uh, Design. And I've been taking those courses, trying to learn how to make different T-shirts and learning about branding. Uh, that's kind of what I'm into right now. And uh, I plan on ha releasing my own brand. I hear pretty soon called Steel. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, make sure you send us a link. We'll we'll publish it out for you. Thanks, man. I, I can't wait. I definitely will get it out to you. Hey, definitely we're waiting on that. I can't wait to see that there. My man, I got you, Leroy. Any last okay. questions, Leroy? Um what's the hardest thing uh about not playing basketball? Is it the competition itself or is it do you like the preparation? What do you miss most since we're all stuck and there's, you know, no basketball, no baseball, none of that? As an athlete, what's the toughest part of that for you? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, the toughest part for me, honestly, is the routine. Not, not having my routine, you know. Okay. I got used to – I mean, I'm used to being – in a gym, even if this was the off season, I would be working out in the morning, then going on to the gym and then doing this and doing that. But right now it's none of this. So that's the most, the most difficult part, like not having that routine. So like I said, I got to go outside and just run. I feel, I feel like uh, you know, Lance Armstrong or something. I want to be <laughs> in the gym. And, and that's, that's what I miss the most. But the, that competitive, like the competition, definitely miss that. You know, you take for granted those small battles and everything. You know, running down the court, not letting your man beat you down the court. Uh, you know what I mean? Actually sitting down on defense you know, or somebody trying to stop you from getting to the goal. All of those little things, man. Going to set a proper screen, rolling and catching the ball. It all, like I miss it. <laughs> and how long would it take you? Because, I mean, it's been, let's just say, two months since yeah. any of us had any real routine how long would it take you to be back at your highest competitive level because you can't go from zero to 100 overnight nah probably take about two weeks you know two weeks if i can come in be consistent same routine um eat the right way and get myself back in shape first off is going to be getting in shape you know right. and playing shape is completely different from any yeah. other things. <laughs> you know getting back in shape and then going from there uh consistently working on the skills every day and uh, that would be it it would probably take me about two weeks because i'm already i don't ever really get out of shape you know yeah but just that last little bit to get you back in pre basketball condition yeah basketball condition is way different man and these guys who were good or the guys that used to be good good ball players that haven't played in, in, in years they're probably better than me. And I'm like, man, you might have been more skilled, more better back then. But right now, you can't keep up. <laughs> right. And yeah. that's just a fact. 
Uh, uh, you know, that's not bravado, bragging, or anything. So, yeah, that's that's it. Leroy, I got a question for you, man. Yes, sir. I got an answer. How much longer are you going to be doing this? I love it. Until I can't? Until you Until, can't. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you bring that up because I, I will tell people occasionally, uh, I, I don't ever plan to retire. I to die doing some kind of work. I'm just going to kill her. I mean, it's going to be either natural causes or a heart attack or I get hit by a truck in the middle. As long as I have any kind of health and breath in me, then I'm going to be doing this. Because um, I, I love it. I love being busy. I love finding some small way to give back. And this is my way I can give back. Man, I appreciate you. Like you said, you give back. I appreciate you. I'm sure the entire city of Memphis appreciates you. You've been doing a good job for a long time. You're a pretty fair guy. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate that. No. And uh, I, I was told last week, uh, somebody gave me a, a good idea uh, starting later on this week. Chuck's maybe even today. Uh, I'm going to be putting out uh, tweets about some of our unsigned seniors. So if you see some of my tweets, you know, give me a retweet. Because uh, college coaches need to know. There's probably about 30 kids out there right now who can still go to college and earn a scholarship and help somebody. So I'm, I'm going to be putting their profiles out and, you know, trying to get coaches to understand, hey, look, there's still some kids you can sign. Got you, man. If y'all guys need anything from me, man, you got my number. Just let me know. And uh, follow me on Instagram, underscore Farrakhan. <laughs> you know what? I've got to do that, Farrell, because – Instagram, you know, Brian and I being old kids, <laughs> I have an Instagram account, but I don't even remember what the doggone password is for it. I have never used my Instagram account. Well, I will uh, say, man, Facebook probably is more, more your lane. <laughs> Facebook and Twitter, yeah, that's true. But, you know, if I want to reach out to a younger audience, which I do want to do that, you know, you got to go where they are, and they're on IG, period. All right. It is what it is. Yeah. Hey, I'm here for you, man. So, Brian, we got to step our Instagram game up. Man. You, us old men, got to step this up a little bit. Let them know, hey, look, we ain't dead just yet. We can do it. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Brian. Yes, sir. It was a dead giveaway. You're not from Memphis. You got an Under Armour Tigers pullover <laughs> on. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a Tiger Sports Report. Yeah, Rivals uh, was once sponsored by Under Armour. Yep. It was uh -huh. funny because didn't I uh, – I sent Leroy a Tiger Sports Report shirt, and I think he told me he just threw it – not in the trash, but threw it in the uh, closet because it wasn't, what, Nike? <laughs> you got to be Nike, man. <laughs> and, and it's funny you bring that up, Brian, because the shirt I've got on, I've got on my Nike University of Memphis shirt. Uh, thank you, Jennifer Rodriguez. She gave me this <laughs> like 39 years ago. But, yeah, you know – Memphis is a Nike town. You got three Nike facilities here. And I mean, these kids don't wear Under Armour. They wear Nike, period. I like, it it now, man. I like it though. I had no problem. It, it was free. That's why I got it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Appreciate y'all, man. Thank y'all uh, for having me. Yeah, thank, thank you uh, for your time. Leroy, we'll see you again soon. Farrakhan, uh, good to know. Wish you the best, man. All right. Thanks. See y'all. Okay. All right, y'all take it easy.